Okay, so I've been wanting to share uh, this book for you with you rather <clears throat> for a long, long time. And it's probably one of the best books that I've ever read on this topic that I have studied for many, many, many years of my life. Uh, the author, I don't know if the author actually is born again, but he's taken this, you know, terrific amount of information that's out there and compiled it in this book. And this book actually is one of the best books I have ever read on the topic. And I'm very familiar with the piece, very familiar. And then he has another book. <laughs> And I'm not going to talk about that book today, but it is actually one of the worst books that I've ever read on The Bride of Christ. The worst, uh, conversely so. So that's kind of funny. But anyhow, for this particular book, for what uh, he has to say here, I really like The Seven Festivals of the Messiah. Very, very, very good. And I want to talk about Passover. And I don't know if dear Eddie gets it or not. He's not a Jew. He's a Gentile. But the seven festivals of the Messiah, irregardless, he does a good job explaining this part. One of the most fascinating and, and yet probably one of the least understood topics of the Bible is that of the feasts found in Leviticus 23. This book, step by step, examines each festival from the foundational truths of God wants us to learn through them. These festivals prophetically speak of the first and second comings of Jesus or Yeshua, as well as provide tremendous insight into the Christian life and our personal relationship with God. This book will even answer the Jews' question, is Jesus, Yeshua, the long-awaited Messiah, Mashiach of Israel? As you study the foundational truths of the festival of the Lord revealed in this powerful Bible reference volume, not only will you and your ministry grow spiritually, but your personal walk with God will blossom to a new dimension as well. Well, I mean, you'll just understand the this, this scripture. The festivals of the Lord found in the 23rd chapter of the book of Leviticus are among the most fascinating and revealing topics of study and inspiration in the entire Bible. Yet, at the same time, they are probably the least understood. This book will lead you step by step through the festivals. Believers who are lovers of God's word will discover that the festivals or feasts of the Lord are not only historical events, but also prophetic. They speak in much detail about the first and second coming of the Mashiach. In addition, the festivals give us tremendous insight into living the life that God desires for his people. And for the Jew, this book will reveal the Messiah, the Mashiach, and the traditions of the ancient Jewish faith handed down faithfully from generation to generation. Non-Jewish believers will learn to appreciate the Jewish roots of the Christian faith uh, to a point, to a point. In addition, ardent Bible prophecy students will discover keys of understanding the seven festivals of the Messiah to lock, to unlock rather a lot of mystery and confusion in this area. They're not the law. The law is the law. <laughs> The ceremonial law and the Ten Commandments part of the law is nothing to do with the peace. The peace are its own thing. Regardless uh, of what you understand, you will spiritually grow, etc., etc. All right, let's get to the good stuff. The appointed feasts. Understanding the feasts of the Lord were given to us by God so his people could understand the coming of the Messiah and the role that the Mashiach would play in redeeming and restoring both man and earth back to God. Following the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, although most non-Jewish believers have heard of the feasts, the deep meaning and importance of these feasts are almost universally not understood. And I think there's a reason why that's squashed, but I will save you from that. And just stick to this book. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Gentile believers in Colossae about the feasts of the Lord, the new moon, and the Sabbath, the Shabbat. Days were, look at that, a shadow, a shadow of things to come to teach us about the Messiah. Colossians 2, 16 and 17, Yeshua, or Jesus, means salvation, 
And he is the substance of the fulfillment of the greater plan that God revealed and foreshadowed in these seven important festivals or feasts. Um, to all the readers who are familiar with the feast, you will be most fascinated to discover that the first four of the feasts are Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, and these primarily teach about the significant events in the first coming of the Mashiach. While these events were also an important part of God's redemption of mankind. In addition, you'll discover the last three, uh, Feast of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah is what the modern day people call it, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, uh, give a fascinating insight concerning important events that surround the second coming of the Messiah. But today we just really want to study um, Passover, but he's setting you up right now. Why study the feasts? Well, there's at least two good reasons. First, all believers that love God with all their hearts seek to serve him daily. And there is an in-depth understanding in the Bible uh, to have this deep depth of a personal relationship that God desires to have with us. Most Bible believers understand their personal relationship with God the same way I view my personal relationship with God for many, many years, attend the local congregation, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to get into all of his stuff about that. I just want to nail the main points here. Uh, we need this spiritual understanding of the festivals because that will give us this big key to unlocking the mystery. And there's lots of mysteries in the Bible, not like Jonathan Kahn coming up with a mystery for everything, but the biblical mysteries. Um, so let's go there. And secondly, the feasts, the festivals are God's feasts and very important, his appointed times that we are to. And if you choose not to observe them, that is completely in your liberty to do. But you should at least know about them and understand them. That's very, very important. God gave these festivals or feasts to teach about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. And the empowering of believers by the Holy Spirit, the Royal Kokodesh, the resurrection of the dead, the coronation of the Messiah, the wedding of the Messiah, the tribulation, which is this phrase here, the birthing pains of the Messiah right here. And then the second coming of the Messiah, the millennium and the messianic age and so on and so forth. And much more can be said about that. The Bible provides several powerful reasons for studying and understanding the seven festivals of the Messiah. The feasts are in the Bible, and all of the Bible is inspired by God, 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. The feasts are a shadow of things to come that teach us about the Messiah, Colossians 2, 16 and 17 and Hebrews 10, 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, this is the law, and not the very image of those things can never with those sacrifices which they are offered year by year continually make comers therefore unto perfect. Meaning, in this particular verse, you will never be able to keep the Ten Commands because the moment that you come into the world and you start making choices, you've already broken them and they require absolute perfection and they are pointing towards the Messiah. The Messiah comes and he is the one that keeps them for you and you get his imputed righteousness. And that's why faith, the law of faith is what it's called. The law of faith is what people have to go through because you can't just obey the Ten Commands and get in. You'll never obey the Ten Commands. So that that's an okay scripture. It's okay. But this one is specifically about... You know, let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in the respect of a holy day, see, or of the new moon or the Shabbat days, which are the shadow of things to come. But the body is Christ. And they're important because they're going to teach you about your Lord. So that's, that's a good thing. The feasts are prophetic types and explain foreshadowing significant events in God's plan of redemption. 
which is awesome. So 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 6 and 11. I actually just want that scripture so I can go check it real quick. And just stay on point with all of these. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how our forefathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. All did eat the same spiritual meat. All did drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Good scripture. And now these were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. I think I jumped a verse. Uh, but with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And we want, hold on, where's our verse 10? I think we needed a verse 10. Neither murmur, uh, ooh, the murmur will be destroyed. Alrighty. Oh, we need, we needed verse 11. I'm sorry. Okay, let's see what's cooking with verse 11. Now, all of these things happen unto them for examples, and they are all written for our admonition upon who the ends of the earth are come. Yep, that's coming. God gave the feast so we could learn and understand God's plan of redemption for the world and our personal relationship to him. The feasts, as a part of the Torah, which means instruction, are the schoolmaster, the schoolmaster or the tutor that leads us to the Mashiach. Yes, absolutely. Galatians 3, 24. I think everybody should read Galatians 3 and 4 like every day of their life, in my humble opinion. The feast will point to the Messiah and God's plan for the world through him. In Psalm 46 through 8 and Hebrews 10, 7. Um, I do want to see this psalm really quick. Oh, okay. Slaughtering a meal offering you did not desire. You have opened my ears. Ascending offering, incense offering. Oh, okay. You did not ask for, and then I said, See, I have come in the book of the scroll, it is prescribed for me. I have delighted to do your pleasure, oh, my Elohim, and your Torah is within my heart. So, in other words, Christ came to fulfill what the Lord said. You know, because the, the Bible is written about him, is the point. He told the Pharisees, you you look in the scriptures, uh, but you don't, you, um, I forget exactly how he phrases it. His whole point is that they're missing the greater point that the scriptures are all pointing to him in the end of the day, at the end of the day. Uh, and then Hebrews 10, 7. Okay, sure. And this is where Paul uh, quotes it then, or whoever the author of Hebrews is. I think it was Paul. Here I am, and it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. So, yes, he's quoting from that Psalm 40. Very nice. Jesus came to fulfill what was written in the Old Testament and what consists of three parts, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Mm -hmm. These things are true. Personified by the Psalms concerning him. Yes, and then he says to the two guys on the road to Emmaus, uh, he goes through and he explains, opens their understanding how all the writings of the prophets were about him, pointing to him, in other words. The feast set forth the pattern of heavenly things on earth. God gives 
the natural to explain the spiritual. Yes. So 1 Corinthians 15, 46 and 47. That's a really important thing to understand. Construct to understand. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. And then he's talking about the, the two atoms and... Um, The first one is the natural one, and the second one is the Lord from heaven. And just 1 Corinthians is amazing. By studying the natural, we can understand the spiritual. What is the meaning of the word feast in the Bible? So it's not num num buffet time. Two important Hebrew words appear in Leviticus chapter 23, and each word is translated as feast in English. In verse 2, the word for feast is the Hebrew word, and this is really important, moed. As it is written, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feast or the moed of the Lord. The word moed, and this is really important, means an appointment, an appointment, a fixed time or season, a cycle of a year, an assembly, a gathering together. An appointed time, a set and exact time. And we are at this channel, ones who go by the feast for the rapture. And the rapture has a scheduled date of being fulfilled on a feast of trumpets. And Hebrews 10.25 says that we are not to forsake the gathering together of the saints as some are in the habit of doing but we are to comfort one another as we see the day. Day is capped. So the day of judgment, the day of trumpets, the day of the last trump, so on and so forth, approaching. And so we reject the belief that has been perpetuated by the Tim LaHaye's, who, who's a Mason, by the way, he's dead now, that the rapture, and many others, many others have said it, that the rapture is any second. It's signless. It's any second. Nobody knows anything, including Jesus. That's what they say. But biblically, when you look at the Moeds, which is what he's talking about here, it comes down to an appointment time. And you have to understand the feast so you can understand what thing God is doing at what time. And then each year you're supposed to watch for the fulfillment of what would be now the Feast of Trumpets. And let me pull this down for a second here. Let me get this picture for you. So we talk about this a lot on this channel. We really go by a Hebrew perspective, but through the renewed covenant, no funny business, faith through grace, period, end of story. Let me get that for you. Not a bad picture. So the spring ones, Passover is death. Unleavened bread is burial. See the little tomb? See the cross? See the tomb? First fruits, he raises up out of the tomb into his new body that's your resurrection you have 50 days later pentecost the indwelling and infilling of the church and it's been going ever since then you have the you have what is likened to the summer harvest, okay? And that's the church age, right? This bride has been growing. He's adding into the numbers. People are getting born again. And we're going to get to a point here one of these days or one of these years. And is this year not weird? Huh? Huh? I've never in my life ever been remanded and restricted, cut off from being able to go to church. That's a communistic standpoint, all under the guise of some big giant lie, which I talk about in many other videos. I invite you to check out all my videos. I have a lot of videos talking about many diverse topics for today. But anyhow, and what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to be watching for the Feast of Trumpets to be fulfilled. And so I have postulated the idea, what if we are in fact just bouncing day by day by day, friends, 
on year 5,992. And we would be, oh, I think 190 days out from this year's Feast of Trumpets, which would be October the 17th. And so what if, what if, dear ones, year, that, that's their new year, okay? And so that would flip over the, the calendar to year 5,000, this is what I'm asking, 5,993, and then you have the seven years between trumpets and atonement, Jacob's time of trouble, Daniel's 70th week, so on and so forth, right? Church, out of here, you get glorified. The damned uh, who didn't listen and, and respond, the slaves and the uh, people who have religion but not rebirth in Jesus, they stay, they go through the tribulation, some choose Christ, others do not. And you have Christ coming back then and dealing with the Israelites that do come running to him. Beautiful. You have, you know, 5,993 plus seven and then bam, 6,000 years and the end of the curse. Hallelujah. Right. In wrestling, did you ever see the one guy tag out and the other guy tag team in? Have you seen that? I saw that when I was a kid. Well, that's kind of what you have happen. You have the kingdom of Lucifer that the fallen Adam, Adam had given to him. He mismanaged the 6,000 years, turned it into a hellhole. That last seven years being the worst of the worst. And we're obviously setting up for that. We talk about that in many other videos of recent. We'll continue doing videos discussing that. Because uh, you are in the preliminary setup of that according to certain scriptures in Matthew 24, certain scriptures in uh, Mark 13, and certain scriptures in Luke 21. And we'll be doing a video talking about that in a little bit, not right now. Uh, but anyhow, 6,000 years under the curse and the great trumpet. So if the last trumpet sounded here, the first trumpet was back here. First trumpet, last trumpet, great trumpet. Isaiah talks about the great trumpet. That's the kibosh on the curse. And you have a little bit of cleanup and some mark takers get thrown into the pit and some nations that are sheep nations get put into the, the thousand years of peace and prosperity with the king, the return of the king for a thousand years. It's going to be wonderful. What if we are in fact 100 and I think it's 90 days out. Let me double check here before I tell you that. Hold on. Uh, Yep, see, my computer's like, I totally know what you're going to go see. Okay, April. Hold on. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's the 10th already. That's crazy. That's crazy talk. Okay, fine. 190 days out. What if that is what's going on? Well, every year you're supposed to be watching and paying attention because it is a potentiality for him to fulfill that glorious feast. So that will we do. Uh, and so these are the spring ones. Uh, Pentecost kind of gets counted into that, but you have this four month harvest John 4 talks about that is likened to the church age. And we very well could be walking up to Feast of Trumpets. And if people are going to be born again, they need to be born again before, before the Feast of Trumpets. Very important because he will be accepting people's rejection. And then you're going to get the consequence, which is going to be the devil and his son. So not good things. So moeds matter. Moeds are muy importante. So if you go by what the Hebrew words dictate, he has a, a set time or an exact time, or an appointed time. Does that sound random to you? No. Because an appointment means that both parties understand when this is going to go down. And you might go, no, no, no. It's called the day and hour no man knows. The exact title of the day that's a wedding thing with a sliver moon is called the day and hour no man knows. It never, in Hebrew thought, means you can't know. In fact, there's consequences for those who refuse to watch, which basically in a nutshell means you didn't get born again. You didn't follow directions, did you? There's another scripture and he talks about, um, you know, unbelievers are never going to know when he's coming. You know why? 
because they don't believe him. <laughs> They're not going to believe that he's coming and not know the day because they never believe him. They don't even believe he's real. That's their problem of unbelief. So you have that issue. In another scripture, he says, um, I forget exactly how he phrases it, but he's, he's saying that uh, it almost in the English sounds like you better be watching because he could be coming at any time. And when you go dig into the Greek, it actually means that people have all kinds of various opinions, right? And you hear that today. People think it's any second. Some people will put his return at every feast and they'll just go down the line. I'm willing to bet you dollars to donuts. Somebody on Facebook has gotten everybody riled up to be watching for the rapture on Passover. It's not going to happen on Passover because he doesn't go and re-fulfill a second time Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, or Pentecost. The other big one is Pentecost. Some people will do a big whoop de doo about um, first fruits. That was his resurrection, not yours. You'll get one, but that's not when. A big one is Pentecost. Big, 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 big. But again, that is not the pickup window. It's this Feast of Trumpets. It is a set period of time. It's really important that people understand the Moed, it means an appointment, a fixed time or season. Um, so it is an appointment with humanity to fulfill certain events in the redemption. In fact, Yeshua came to earth at the exact time ordained by God, Galatians 4, 2, and 4. And God has an exact time uh, and a set appointment in the future when he will judge the world. Yes, Acts 7, 31. Yes, Paul says he, he commands all men everywhere to repent, that, that at times past God winked at sin uh, and had mercy for you. But after Christ came and after the exposure to the gospel and the Holy Spirit convicting people's hearts and so on and so forth, you now have a responsibility to get your sins forgiven. And if you don't, he does have a set point when he will come and judge the world. Yes. And that, that, that judgment day is obscured horribly and ignored by the Gentile church. Drives me nuts. In verse 6 is another Hebrew word translated for feast. And it is written on the 15th day of the same month as the feast of unleavened bread, shag, I'm probably not pronouncing it right, because guess what, I'm not Hebrew, which means a festival, and it is derived from the Hebrew root word shagag, which I'm probably not pronouncing right either, which means um, to move in a circle, to march in a sacred pr procession, to celebrate, dance, to hold a solemn feast or holiday. You know what, I bet that they don't pronounce the CH the way that we do in English. I bet it's Hagag. Anyhow, uh, by this we see that God, look at this, this is so important, gave the festivals the cycles to be observed yearly so that by doing them, we can understand God's redemptive plan for the world, the role that the Messiah would play in that redemption and our personal relationship to God concerning how we grow from a baby believer to a mature believer. Yes, although God gave us the festivals to observe, God never gave the festivals so that we would... What does it say? We would obtain salvation from him by observing them because salvation only comes by faith. Right. However, God did give the festivals for the purpose of teaching and instructing his people concerning his plan of redemption and our personal relationship to him. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like all that. That's good. That's good. The appointed place. The feasts are not only God's appointed times, but they were also to be observed at God's appointed place. Now let's slow down for a moment. If you go, well, where's Moed in the Bible? It's actually in the opening page of Genesis 1.14. And this is what he says, see? This is what he says, why he made the heavens and the earth for signs and seasons. Not fall, spring, winter, blah, 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 but the Moeds. It just so happens that we do have festivals, but it's really about these feasts and how the feasts take place within the agricultural cycle for the Jew. 
that there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate day and night and so on and so forth. So he uses the universe like a clock. And he sets appointments and then he gives you the Bible and then he expects you to understand the appointments. God said that he would choose a place and that place would be a set place where his redemptive plan would be accomplished. Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles were to be observed at an appointed place. Yeah. Um, very true. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, though. Not that there's anything wrong with it. Yeah, I mean, there was three make-it-or-break-it times they had to assemble. Very true. A lot could be said about that, but I don't want to talk about that right now. Okay, traditionally, non-Jewish Bible believers understand the, the festivals to be exclusively Jewish feasts. And that is a huge, huge error. Okay, this is where he's going to make a super important and really, really, really good point. However, Leviticus 23, 1, 2, and 4 tells us very clearly that these are the feasts of who? The Lord. And in reality, God in his divine wisdom instructed us that these festivals are for both the Jew and the Gentile, and they're to be celebrated jointly with each other. In Deuteronomy 16, 11, and 14, the word translated in English as the stranger is the Hebrew word for Gentile. Who has joined himself to the Jewish people? Remember, like Ruth, she was like, Well, I'm a Moabite, but I'm going to go get with Boaz, and we're going to have Obed, and Obed is going to have Jesse, and Jesse and his wife are going to have King David. And so you have this Gentile Ruth in the DNA line of the Messiah. That's huge. And so, um, Therefore, the Lord is the host of the festivals, and all Bible believers, all, are invited guests. And you can't really say that Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits is only for the Jews. You have to admit that that is what comprises the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, by his death, burial, and resurrection. And today is the anniversary of his death. This is not for just one people group. They were supposed to tell everybody else, and you could have a mixed company of the stranger among you. Yes. What he didn't want was the stranger to be worshiping false gods and bring false gods to the people. That was the no-no. And some people will even try to say, well, that God didn't want, you know, you to be with certain colors of people. No, 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 and no. Remember when Miriam got all snotty with Moses' uh, black wife? And Miriam got leprosy. Remember that? God's like, oh, you don't like skin color, huh? And uh, so that was God's take on that. He created the whole rainbow of flesh. What he doesn't like is the false gods and the other nations that worship false gods. If you are a Gentile or you're black or you're whatever, God is not mad at you. He made you. And you can come and be part of his shindig that he's having. He just doesn't want the false gods. So people really need to like get that clear in their minds. That's really important stuff to understand. Because that's been used to breed a lot of unfair garbage against people that nobody can control their DNA. Nobody can control their skin color. And God made you and you're important to him and you're special and he loves you. But he's not having the false gods because that's Satan and his brood of horrible angels. In order to fully understand and appreciate the feast being appointed times given by God, it is important to understand the biblical calendar that God gave us. Yes. Can I get an amen? There are two primary calendars in the Bible. The first is the civil. Okay. He does the most masterful job I have ever read in my entire life of explaining the two calendars. I have heard Jews before that cannot explain this. He does a magnificent job. So there is the civil calendar and it is used from Genesis to Exodus. The first month is the civil calendar, Tishri. 
Rosh Hashanah, that Feast of Trumpets, the Jewish New Year. Remember that thing that I told you is coming in 190 days and we're seeing the day approaching? Hello, global lockdown, big giant global lie. Hello, tent city is being put up all over the place by your friendly Christian masons for your friends and families impending extermination. Read Revelation 6. They're setting up for that. And you do not want to be here for that. Okay, then the second calendar in the Bible is the religious calendar. The religious calendar is used from Exodus to Revelation. Uh, let's see, Exodus 12 to Revelation 22. God established the religious calendar in Exodus 12 to as it is written, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. The month that God was referring to was the month of Aviv, which is now called the month of Nisan. Okay. Prior to God's establishing the month of Nisan as the first month in the religious calendar, it was the seventh month in the civil calendar. Well, flippy floppy there for you. And there's a reason for that. You might go, this is so boring. Kill me now. No, 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 really, there's a reason why you did this, and it's brilliant. Just keep listening. This guy nails it. This is way more exciting. Okay, so check this out. So the seventh month in the civil calendar, right? God gave the religious calendar so that we could understand these feasts, which he gave, which are his appointed times, and the foreshadowing of important events in the redemption, which happen on the days he ordained on the religious calendar. Muy importante. The important days on the religious calendar are the same days that he gave as feasts in Leviticus. Super important. Another understanding of God giving a civil calendar and a religious calendar is that everyone who accepts the Messiah, that is Yeshua, and I hate this language of into your heart by faith. I hate that. You are trusting in the death, burial, and resurrection when you repent and agree with him that you're a sinner and that you need him to have the Father's wrath poured out on you, on him rather, and not you. On Jesus and not you. And you, you, you accept that by faith through his grace. Anyhow, for those that do that, you experience, what, two birthdays. Mm-hmm. Two birthdays. So I have a physical birthday when I was born on this planet in February. And then I have a second birthday when I got born again in January. And I am waiting for Feast of Trumpets so that I can get my new body that goes along with that new birth. Just like Tishri 1, that's your Feast of Trumpets, that's their new year is the first day of the civil calendar, and Nisan 1 is the first day of the religious calendar, everyone who gets reborn again in Christ has a physical, civil birthday when he or she was born into the world. So your flesh, slap your arm, your flesh, and a spiritual, religious birthday, the day he accepts what the Messiah did in his stead or her stead. The following chart illustrates both types of calendars showing the names of the months in the biblical calendar. I've never heard anybody in my entire life explain it the way that he just triple nailed it. And I have always heard people talk about the two calendars. I have always heard people try to cancel them out and get them to fight against each other. And he just explains it perfectly. If you are in Christ, you have two birthdays. And the, the religious one is based upon what you're doing with the feasts or what you're doing with the moed, what you're doing with the appointments. So if you showed up, so to speak, for the Passover, unleavened bread and first fruits, and you got born again, you got the Holy Spirit to go back inside you and resuscitate or resurrect or quicken or however you want to phrase that your spirit, you now have a second birthday. You have a religious birthday. So I got born again in a cold January month. And I don't know what day it was because I was just a hot mess 15 times over. But the Lord was good to me. And it was like, uh, I don't know, a week or two before my 
my physical birthday. And I just, I remember that, I remember what happened that day. I was primed for a long time and just, I hadn't been told the truth, but I was primed for a long, long, long time. And when I finally heard two people explain to me the gospel, I went, that's what I want. And it kind of went back to me at church my whole entire life, hearing about eternal life, eternal life, eternal life. And I always wanted eternal life. I just didn't know. I didn't understand because I was spiritually dead. And I was in darkness and sin. And I was just, when the spirit is dead, you just don't get it. But when the Holy Spirit comes along and you ha have the, you hear, you have the hearing of the word, and those two things kind of meet and kiss together, so to speak. And you understand, oh, I'm the sin he's going to punish. Ah, so I'm not a good person? No. So Jesus is the good person? Yes. So I'm going to go to hell to pay for my sins? Yes. Well, what can I do? Put them by faith, the law of faith, on to the sacrificial lamb, which is what he did today for us. By faith, through grace, and bam, the Holy Spirit comes inside your temple body, and you get born again. And there is your second birthday. Your spirit came alive inside of you, right? As you start getting your mind right with God by reading his word and eating that spiritual meat, right? You're going you're gonna to start out drinking milk, right? And we're all at different places in our sanctification, and some go quick and some go slow and some are in between. As you're reading that Bible and you get hungry for that truth. Hungry, hungry, hungry. And you're sucking that down. He starts teaching you the spiritual uh, realities of this world. And you start getting your soul or your heart fixed. Right? So he's starting to repair you step by step. He triages you. First, it's that spirit. Oh, he's back alive again. Yay! And the Holy Spirit is yoked in and sealed forever because you're born again forever. There's no losing your salvation. You can't be unborn again. Then you get your soul and your heart and your mind and your thinking right. And yeah, you're going to repent of sins. And yeah, you're going to bonehead it sometimes. And yeah, you're going to walk in holiness and sometimes. Uh, and all of these things as you're imputed in the grace of Christ and his wedding clothes for you. Covered in those lamb skins metaphorically. And then guess what? The last final thing, which is what we're waiting for, for this Feast of Trumpets. And I'm hoping it's this Feast of Trumpets in 190 days. We'll find out if he rules it out or if he comes and you're going to start to see some weird stuff ticking off in uh, Luke 21. Some some rumbling and jumbling going on. Some freaked out waves. The, the non-human part of creation starts getting upset. You know why? Because it's judgment day and the judge is here and he's coming. Revelation 10. Read Revelation 10. He is coming here and then he ascends up. Psalm 47. He comes to the land first. Revelation 10. Psalm 95. The king is here. All these psalms are about the king coming on judgment day. And then some things happen and some conversation happens between the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Ecod, unity. And then he, Psalm 47, ascends up and he calls us with the last trump and we meet him in the air. First Thessalonians 4, what is that, 16 and 17 at that last trump, at that twinkling of the eye, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. And uh, his, his, his children are called. His wife is called and that is according to having that second birthday that's so important those who chose not to do that will not be participating you will be gifted the judgment of the antichrist and he's by this point he's got to be up and running ai enhanced and i think he's in that un compound i have a video on that i'll try to remember to put that in there uh, for you but anyhow, much more could be said about that as we're setting all of this up. He lists out for you and helps you understand what's going on. He shows you on the civil calendar, Tishri being listed as first, which is very interesting. It's a flippy flop. That's so interesting. 
But here in the religious calendar, the seventh month, and seven is his number. That is his thing. That is Yahweh's thing. That's seven. He rested on that seventh day. And you will too. You will too. That Shabbat of that seventh day ends up being uh, concurrent with that thousand year rest of the Lord. And you're going to be hanging out on the earth on a glorified body. There'll be sheep in there too that uh, he lets in and they have children. And Isaiah has a lot to say about that. Anyhow, thousand years with the king. I mean, it's just going to be wonderful. So uh, I think what we're going to do is go ahead and say goodbye for now on this one because we needed to give a nice primer for the festivals and why they're important. I do want to show you Strong's word for, hold on. I want to go into Bible Hub, though, because I'm always in Bible Hub. So I grew up in an English Bible reading it, but really until I get into the Hebrew and the Greek, I'm just not getting the full story. It was written in Hebrew and Greek. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide between the day and the night and let them be for the signs and the seasons, for days and for years. Season. So this is the plural of it. Okay. So this is a good one to memorize too. The Strong's 4150. He says, I've got these appointments. I'm going to do this thing and you need to know about them. And when you read your Bible, it will help you to understand it when you know about these things. My Moed, my holy feasts, my appointment times with you, appointed time, place, meeting. And I'm going to have seven of these. And actually, he even goes into an eighth one, which I don't want to talk about right now. But appointed time, a particular time, a pilgrimage, sacred seasons, Psalm uh, 104, 19. I don't want to look all that up right now. Right, the congregation comes together, and that's the aspect of the rapture the congregation coming together, and you get your new body, right? Because you had a birthday, and now you're gonna have your birthday, right? <laughs> Appointed meeting at the temple, you are the temple filled with God now, which is what He wants for everyone. He wants to give everybody a second birthday, an appointment, a fixed time, a season, a, you know, on and on and on it goes. Does this look random to you? No. So I'm afraid that all these Masons have snuck in and all of these detractors and liars and the TV churches, not all churches, but the TV churches, the Calvary chapels, which I used to be a part of for a long time. Um, so many people on television and they were all telling people, oh, the rapture's random. Can't know anything about it, blah, blah, blah. But you go to the scriptures and it says, no, 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 no. It's on a feast day and you got to figure out what feast day. And then you start studying everything there is to know about about the Feast of Trumpets and the wedding occasion and, and so on and so forth. Much more could be said about that. The day and hour no man knows, the sliver moon, um, the incoming. I mean, all of these things. And you find out it's not random at all. It never has been. It's a day to watch for by being reborn again. And those that will not watch are going to get in trouble. Meaning if you didn't get born again, you're so going to get in trouble. So anyhow, I hope that was helpful for you. Join me for part two because we're going to go into chapter two, an overview of the festivals, understanding the feasts. And then I'm hoping that we're going to be able to get to Passover uh, pretty soon here because I really want to go back over these uh, four spring feasts so that they can kind of be available to people as we're experiencing them or within close proximity to when they're uh, being experienced because there's going to come a time, friends, when you come to that final year, and we talked about this, of 5,992. And then remember that Feast of, of Trumpets is going to click over like a New Year's, right? Like in America, New Year's in January. And that is going to trip a series of events of him coming here. Okay. And when in Luke 21, here, let me just show you really quick. 
I believe it's the 25th verse. And there's a lot going on in the 21st chapter of Luke. And I don't want to talk about all that right now. Because he gets into, well, I don't want to talk about all that right now. But hold, hold on a second. Um, I'm trying to remember. Let's just, here, we'll do this. Okay, I wasn't going to do this, but I'm just going to put this in really, really, really quick. Okay, so, you know, his disciples are asking him about the temple, and Jesus is like, well, they're making comments about it, and Jesus is like, that thing is going to get <laughs> demolished, <laughs> which for a Jew back in that time, you're like, what? Because the temple was a big deal. That, that was your meeting place between God and man, right? Like, that was a big deal. But it got severely abused, taken advantage of by certain people, and so on and so forth. And so then they start asking him questions. They're like, oh, when shall these things be? And what will the sign be when these things shall come to pass? Right? Like, they're completely curious. And there was the whole 70 AD thing. But then it's really interesting because, and you have to look at all three of the synoptic gospels together, which we're not in right now. But I want to show you what I have been seeing as I study this, not only in the English and prayer and fasting and so on and so forth, stuff like that on occasion, but then also going into the Greek, which we're not going to do in this moment. Uh, and I just want to wrap this up. But this is pretty interesting because where we appear to be right now in time and space is that you have finally entered into the pages of these verses right now. And I have studied this quite a lot. I find it absolutely fascinating. And he's talking about how, you know, you are going to, they're going to try to deceive you. And he starts talking about this whole, what ends up being this transhumanist movement, this new age, Masonic, Gnostic, Satanic, everybody in music and Hollywood and fashion industry and governments, governments of the world and all of these people in various religions, on and on it goes. They all want to become false gods and they want to do it through technology. They want to do it through sorcery. They want to do it through this hidden knowledge. They have this God, Lucifer, the light, the light bearer. And so they are really dealing with the God of this world, who's the fake God, right? The fakey fakington. And so they are pursuing this path to destruction and you're in the way. And he's he. this is the backstory of what's going on. And he's telling you in this very punctuated, simplistic sp speech here, that, oh, yeah, they're going to come saying, I am God. And it's actually, I am God. I am God, the ego, I me. In the Greek. And they'll say, the time is drawn near. And I've heard people talk about that. Go not after them. He's saying, don't even listen to them. And like Michael Heiser, he's a Christian, supposedly. Uh, much more could be said about him. I've done a couple hours worth of shows on him. He's telling people, glorification, you're going to get Godhood. I'm like, what? Nah. So, it, you know, you got to be careful. It doesn't matter who the message comes from. If the message is that you can become gods, the message is wrong, right? That's what people need to understand. But that's coming at you from all different angles, right? Celebrities, on and on it goes. Movies, books, television, commercials, videos coming at you. I mean, your kids can go play Roblox and pretend and go in God mode. I'm like, what? That's crazy. So he's like, yeah, that's coming. And you can just check that off in the Vatican in the summer of 2019. Had a big, huge humanity 2.0 shindig. We did a whole bunch of videos on that, too. Uh, that's that's on the channel as well. In our uh, series that we do in Daniel, that marriage of that clay flesh and that iron AI robotics. And they want to become Hubots. They want to become Hushines. Right? Human machines, the rise of the Hushin, human machines. They want to become gods. And so it's really interesting here because he takes you by the hand, and this is where we are right now. You're living in verse 9 of Luke 21. It's so creepy. But when you hear of wars, and this is a war against humanity and commotions, you go get into the Greek on commotions and 
it is multi-layered. Let me tell you, it, there is so much that could be said about the commotions. And we'll end up doing a video as time permits to go in to show you all of that Greek. But exactly what you're seeing happen all around you, this level of destabilization, uh, politically, even the taking you down financially, that's all peppered throughout the Greek. It's really fascinating as I remember it. And he, he literally tells you and gives you a command. Do not be terrified. That's like, don't flip out, freak out, wig out terrified, right? Like they're trying to get into your head with this war uh, on humanity. Don't let them. And in the other two synoptic gospels, he actually adds um, the issue of the rumors of wars, rumors. And that rumors are what you're hearing, but you're not seeing it because this is a psychological war for your thinking and your perception. And you're in the, this is the pre-setup. This is the pre-setup. And that's where you find yourself right now, friends. But do not be terrified. Don't wig out, he's telling you. He's walking with you literally right now through the scripture, the Holy Spirit. For these things must come to pass. And in my Bible, these things are italicized. So he's telling you this, this information right here. But the end, the beginning of the end, the end has a beginning. The beginning of the end is not by and by. And isn't that funny that they would say by and by? In the other synoptic gospels, he says yet. It's not yet. And then he starts going into, in verse 10 and, and beyond, what you can look for when you do see the birthing pains. And you have to kind of look at all the synoptic gospels together. But then what's really interesting here in Luke is that he says, but before all these things, uh, they shall lay hands on you and persecute you and so on and so forth. And what's really interesting is if you've read any of the historical content on the martyrs, from years back, he's telling you about kind of a historical layout for, you know, like foxes, martyrs, and so on and so forth. And there's other sections too that he specifically tells the the um, the disciples. Oh yeah, you gonna get it too, <laughs> which is sad. So a lot going on. And it really looks like he starts bringing you through history, and he starts. Uh, mentioning 70 AD, and he's talking about this for a while, is what it looks like to me, the historical account. And then he talks about, you know, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And again, when you go back to that, the end of that harvest that we talked about, that's so important to understand. Let's pull this down. Right? See the four month harvest period, John 435. And we talked about how this is representative and, and runs concurrent with the church age. When you come to the end of that, then the clock flips over and you've got you've got trumpets. You've got the time of Jacob's trouble. Hello. And then he also I'm going to get way into this, but he also talks about in Revelation 10, he says, time shall be no more. And when you go study all the Greek on that and you just sit and meditate, pray and meditate on the word, it's kind of like God is saying, okay, the time for any more opportunity in this, and I'm just going to say age of grace to keep it simple, is done. I am done. He's like drawing a line in the sand. I... The son of man in Revelation 10, am done. And he is formally telling you here and no farther. And much more could be said about that. But anyhow, you know, it's 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 that metaphorical midnight when it's the ending of one hour and the starting of another, and that's hour one, day one of the seven years of judgment. It's a, it's a transition, in other words. But then what's really interesting is that he starts getting into, in verse 25, this is the day of judgment. This is the deployment of Revelation 12, 
three, four, and five, the, the signs and the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth, the distress of nations with perplexity and the sea and the waves roaring. There's a whole bunch of Psalms that talk about that as well. It's the day of judgment. He comes here and the sea is wigging out. And also if wormwood is inbound and that's one of the judgments, there could be a massive amount of, um, influx of, I don't know, magnetic properties or whatever you want to call it. There's a lot that could be going on with that, but suffice it to say, when the creator comes and he's mad, the earth responds. Okay. That's, that's the great takeaway. The earth is like, ah, <laughs> so even the non-human part of creation is like, ah, really upset because he's upset. And the Holy Spirit's upset, the Father's upset, and the Son, Revelation 10, is really upset. So anyhow, there's Psalms that talk about this uh, perplexity and the sea and the waves roaring. The earth is just upset. The people are upset. Everything is upset. The Lord is upset. This is the day of judgment. And he talks about men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking upon those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. What's coming? Well, you turn to Ezekiel and he's coming down on his chariot. He has a chariot. It's his throne. And it's got the four living creatures. And you might go, I've never heard that before. Well, that's that's in Ezekiel. And that's We'll, we'll, we'll do videos talking about that another day too. But what is it that they're freaking out about? They see him coming. And then, and then look right here, verse 27, it's telling you <laughs> as clear as day. And then they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Read Revelation 10, the son of man, the angel. And it's, it's not the word angel exactly. Angel just means a um, messenger. But the messenger of judgment, i.e. the son of man, is coming in a cloud. He's a rainbow on his head with power and great glory. And he's mad, which is not good. Now, who's he mad at? The unbeliever and the fake Christian. He's not mad at us. And then look, verse 28. This is the day of judgment. He's walking you through this. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads. Literally, he's telling you that thing on, on your neck, lift it up. Look up. <laughs> For your bodily redemption draweth nigh. What does that mean? It's your birthday where you get your new flesh. It's your Revelation 12, 5, the birthing of the one new mankind, the many within, the heir. You're the heir. Read Galatians 3 and 4. It's all there. I don't really want to get into all of this right now because there's a lot going on with that. It's a big, long study in and of itself. So for the sake of time, again, again we're looking at the day of judgment. We're looking at the, the people who are done going to get it. They are going to get it. And and why, are, why is he so mad? Idolatry. Oh, and the fact that they're going to try to kill his bride off and they're about ready to exterminate the population. Yeah, these things make him mad. <laughs> Verse 34, he says, so take heed to yourselves. That's like pay attention. Get this is what he means in the Greek. Get this. Conceptually, get this. It's important. Lest any time your hearts be overcharged and surfeiting and drunkenness, the cares of this life, so that the day comes upon you unawares. What does that mean? He's saying, make sure that you get born again so that this day of judgment does not come upon you where you're unaware. Why? Well, because not only is he coming and he's going to leave, the ark is leaving, but you're going to get exterminated. And that's where a bunch of other scriptures come into play. Look at verse 35. He's telling you, for as a snare, that is a trap, shall it come upon all those who dwell on the whole of the earth. He's trying to explain to you, paired with Psalm 2, they're setting a trap for you. When you look out and you see the tents that they're putting out on the fairgrounds, they're setting a trap to murder you. Get it? And that's coming. 
And him coming is a snare where he's going to leave them and Satan's going to come and Satan's going to double cross the double crossers, right? They all think they're funny because they're pulling one over on you where they're stealing trillions of dollars and doing all this funny business with your money. Uh, and God's like, oh no, I got your number, right? So he says here, look, watch, watch, therefore, this is get born again and then watch for what? The feast of trumpets. That's the next feast to be fulfilled. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That's the feast of trumpets when you get born again. And you're going to stand before the Son of Man. Verse 37, and in the day that he was teaching in the temple at night, he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to the temple to hear him. I have no idea where they, why they put these two verses in here. That is so straight, a strange arrangement. But anyhow, so a lot more could be said about this, but I think that's enough for now. Thank you if you stuck with me for the hour. I really appreciate it. And join me for the next successive chapter, then we will learn more about the feasts. These are really exciting. Happy Passover, guys. God bless.